Hello everyone and welcome to episode 17 of SSTO Space Program. Today we will continue to study the curious case of our Kerbals that have fallen ill on that um, mysterious disease called uh, homesickness and also we will advance quite a lot the construction of our Duna vessel. So let's jump right into it. So as you may remember from last episode of our series, our Kerbals on our first space station have befallen ill on um, a mysterious disease called um, homesickness. And uh, as you remember, we send an orbital ambulance with a medic or a psychologist to help them deal with the life problems, but unfortunately they have proven to be very resistant to, <laughs> to all the attempts uh, to cure them. So Ali Kerman, our mission medic, decided to call KC for extra support and KC decided to send a scientist to study further this mysterious disease. In fact, actually, um, as someone suggested in the comments, it might be that scientists actually are required to operate medbase, but you know, let's go on with the story. <laughs> anyway, um, we are sending a scientist up there. Hopefully that uh, will change something. And we are doing this using our um, the, the first station building SSTO that we uh, that we've made called Ragnarok uh, that uh, have been slightly redesigned to improve its flight characteristics. And what we are sending also, apart from the scientist Max D. Kerman, uh, we are sending a proper relay antenna and also a lot of battery storage because this station is notoriously running out of power every time it's on the dark side of the planet. So now, thanks to um, the immense amount of science that we've got from our Duna station, there is only one science node left to unlock and thanks to that we have those big batteries that uh, I used to make this uh, energy storage module and a proper very long range antenna. That antenna is going to be very useful um, because our Joule colony ship was, as you remember, sent to Joule with the best antenna we had available at the time, which is unfortunately not sufficient to maintain <laughs> a stable communication with KSC. So I was hoping that, uh, you know, before it arrives to Joule and um, permanently loses communication with KSC, we will be able to upgrade, uh, you know, the network around uh, Kerbin a little bit and uh, in fact have um, antennas that are powerful enough to allow us to connect to KSC. Also, another thing that we are sending up are um, pace chairs. Those are um, small vehicles that I made for our Kerbals that will that are supposed to help them with um, all the maintenance and EVA tasks that they are normally doing, but we'll discuss them in detail a little bit later. As you can see, we have safely arrived at our destination and uh, we are ready to deploy our cargo. So, to simplify a little bit the installation process, I decided that we will dock uh, the station module directly in the right orientation uh, while it is still in the cargo bay of our SSTO. And um, as you can see, this was already designed in such a way that it, to make this possible. And the uh, <laughs> funny story is that I actually had to fly this mission twice because, um, you know, in one of my genius moments, I forgot that the docking port that you see uh, on the station is really not a docking port, it's a construction port, and I uh, initially made, made this module with docking port. And I was wondering for like 15 minutes why it uh, would not dock, and I was thinking that maybe it's my crappy docking or, you know, um, my uh, lack of alignment karma actually got to me, finally. But yes, eventually I figured it out, changed the docking ports to construction ports, and as you can see, it docked no problem. Yes, another thing that we brought with us are those space chairs I told you about. The idea behind them is that they are going to help us do all the construction and maintenance work around the station using Kerbal inventory and Kerbal attachment system. Because I don't know if you have noticed this, but um, for me, each time I'm trying to do something in space using Kerbal inventory or and Kerbal attachment systems, those little buggers constantly float away and they are never in the right spot. And since you can only place objects like 3 meters away from where you're standing, and you cannot move your curveball while you grab an object and you want to, you know, drag it somewhere else. It is really a pain in the butt to actually do something. So I figured that we can defeat the system by designing those EVA chests that uh, can not only attach to any surface that you want them to, thanks to a tweak scaled claw that is very small, but they also have this very big kiss container where you can store a lot of things inside. They also have lights, monopropellant, reaction wheels, um, you know, RCS, everything that you need to be, you know, you useful in EVA. And the best part is, when you're boarded on the external seat, your Kerbal still counts as an EVA and the, you know, can use its Kerbal inventory system and stuff, so I hope it will work. Um, we didn't have a chance to test them, because uh, unfortunately Station Engineer is still a tourist and is resisting all the attempts to cure him, but I'm not too worried, because there will be plenty of other occasions to test them. 
Right, so now we can focus on the main goal of this mission, which is um, trying to cure our Kerbals. This time once and for all, uh, using the power of um, science. And the new scientist that we brought with us, Max D. Kerman. And um, long story short, uh, I could talk a little bit about this, but um, in the end, it did not help. Let's call it that way. Nothing happened. I uh, tried moving the scientist inside the med bay. I tried moving the medic out of the med bay. I tried moving both of them out of the med bay and uh, leaving just the patients inside because after reading again the MKS documentation, it looked like that might be also a thing that you don't really need to have a medic in the med bay as the patient. Well, it did not work again for um, a number of days. It uh, nothing really changed. So I don't really know. I think um, either it's a bug or um, I'm doing something wrong or uh, maybe maybe they need something more so i think now it's a good time to decide what we should do with them and uh you know maybe you think that we should build a um <laughs> fully fledged hospital for our kerbals in orbit or um we should actually bring them back home let me know in the comments i'm curious what you've decided and whatever that would be we'll do it so and yes after admitting that this operation was a partial failure I decided that we should bring at least Valentina back to Kerwin, because she is a very competent pilot and we have another mission for her, which will be sending a Minmus lander. But first, she needed to deorbit and land Ragnarok. As you can see, this plane flies really well and has quite a lot of excess fuel, and uh, so landing it was easy and uh, even if you undershoot or overshoot KC, you can always fly back on uh, regular air breathing engines. And this is precisely what I did, I overshot slightly and uh, had to fly back. But um, you know, after a after slight redesign of the wheels, it's... Um, a bit more stable and uh, lands very well and we had a textbook landing on the runway. So the next mission for today is sending a Minmus lander and we'll do it using the Bumblebee SSTO. It's a very old plane actually and uh, has been proven in many flights. Uh, can put around uh, 15 tons of payload into orbit but um, <laughs> it's kind of difficult to land when it's full. When it's not, maybe not when it's full but when it's not completely empty it tends to disassemble spontaneously. But apart from that it's a very successful plane I would say. And you might wonder why do we need a Minmus lander? And uh, the answer to that question is obviously because we have contracts to do a lot of crew reports on from you know low orbit or on low space around Minmus and uh, we have absolutely no way of doing it. So I decided that a small lander would be a great tool to do that. But since we have almost all technologies unlocked right now and I wanted this lander to be able to go into orbit and back multiple times without the constant need of refueling, I thought that ion engines would be the best choice for it. And uh, you know, since Minmus has a really low gravity but also ion engines have a really puny thrust, um, we actually needed two engines to make this work. So I suppose that uh, this makes this lander a Thai lander, which is kind of great, I would say. It has around um, just a little bit under 10,000 meters per second of delta V. So yeah, so it's definitely an overkill for Minmus and uh, we will be able to go into orbit and back multiple times. And the best part is, with MKS nuclear reactors, we can actually replenish xenon gas as well. So I suppose it's going to be a very useful vehicle. Unfortunately, um, we will just do a Minmus burn and we'll continue doing other things because, as you know, going to Minmus takes some time and we have more pressing matters to do here on Kerbin. And one of that matters is launching two new modules for our Duna colony ship. And the first module that we are launching is the big spherical tank for liquid fuel. Uh, the tank itself, uh, when it's empty, is not particularly heavy. I think it's uh, around 250 tons. So as you can see, the SSTO rocket that we'll use to launch it is also relatively small. I mean, it's still ridiculous and <laughs> oversized. But, you know, compared to some other things that we're launching, it's, re it's, it's a relatively small launch. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not so much to talk about this uh, because you've seen it already multiple times. Um, just one thing that I found pretty cool, um, just one new innovation, let's call it that way, that I found is that uh, with those Honey Badger control modules that come with the freight transportation system mod from RoboDude, uh, they integrate reaction wheels and um, very powerful thrusters in uh, every direction. So it allowed me to control the tank um, while saving quite a lot of parts. So that was um, that was a cool solution that I decided I'm gonna use for docking the modules together. Uh, because once we are done with the ship construction we can disassemble them and convert them back into material kits so we don't have to actually carry all that material kits that we'll need anyway on Duna uh, into orbit to our ship so that's that's a great thing I, I like it very much um, apart from that I don't really know uh, just a, a trigger warning here because uh, there will be a lot of graphical docking scenes involved uh, with uh, you know lack of alignment and stuff so if you're sensitive to docking scenes um, please uh, stop watching this video right now <laughs> 
for score <laughs> until the docking scenes are over because uh, it might be disturbing especially for um, younger children and um, you've been warned <laughs> so yes it was uh, quite a lot of docking involved and in all of that construction process is pretty standard once the craft is docked we compress the construction ports forming a permanent connection between the two modules that we just docked and um, yeah that's pretty much it so yes, docking the first module was a success and a funny story. At the end, uh, I uh, really wanted to land this uh, SSTO rocket booster on the runway and I did multiple quick saves, you know, and uh, <laughs> adjustments to actually be sure that I dropped directly on the runway and um, I've managed to do it. And uh, yes, it, as you can see, it landed precisely on the runway. <laughs> <laughs> and the runway exploded, so there goes my savings. <laughs> I guess it wasn't worth it at all. But yeah, well, <laughs> mission accomplished. Landed on the run. Yeah. So, the next module that we are launching today are cargo racks and supplementary fuel tanks. And uh, this module was a little bit heavier than the previous one, but not as heavy as engine compartment with the large reaction wheel. But as you can see, it's not exactly aerodynamic, so I decided to use the same rocket that we uh, used uh, for the first module, because it will give us a little bit of extra thrust and delta V that will be needed to overcome the drag. And uh, yes, there is really not that much to say about this launch apart from that. Uh, well, it was pretty standard. Again, we used the same Honey Badger control modules to control the vessel once it was detached from the um, uh, launch vehicle. Here, as you can see, I launched a little bit too late and uh, our target would be in front of us once we reached our apoapsis. And this is actually something that happens quite often to me uh, and I suppose to everyone else as well. Especially when you're launching something that does not have the same launch characteristics, so it's difficult to estimate how much time it will take you to get into orbit. But there's a really simple way to counter that. Um, all you need to do is perform exactly the same maneuver as if your target was behind you, only in the opposite. So you want your apoapsis to be a little bit higher than the orbit uh, of your target and then using a uh, maneuver node you can circularize or um, at least go into a slightly eccentric orbit and see at which point you are getting closer to your um, final destination and uh, what's even cooler if you put a second maneuver node on the um, orbit that you would have after the circularization you can see after which orbit you will be able to get close to your target and if you do it properly you can actually have an encounter with a relatively smaller velocity towards your target and very small distance at a relatively little delta v expenditure so this is actually a useful method i guess that um, most of you are familiar with it but those who aren't could uh, use it and uh, yeah I, I use it very often it's a, a really cool thing it's a little bit harder to do if your target is in front of you than if your target would be behind you but it's still manageable and uh, relatively easy. So yes, as you can see our circularization burn here was rather large because of the um, not exactly uh, efficient launch profile that we had due to the rather peculiar shape of this cargo and uh, once cargo was detected we proceed with docking and um, well there is um, relatively little to say about that process. This module that we sent right now is mainly supplementary fuel tanks and cargo racks for all the base components that we'll be sending and uh, containers for material kits. All of that is empty and we'll refuel it once the vessel is completed and I actually wanted to launch this module relatively quickly because it has docking ports and thanks to that we can actually start refueling missions again using routine mission manager before the vessel is ready because it will take multiple launches actually to refuel and resupply this vessel to full multiple automatic launches and we also have to do quite a lot of manual launches as well to add uh, all the components that are unique like um, you know the base boxes and everything like that and you know all the extra vehicles but yeah our Duna vessel is taking shape and I really like it it's actually much easier than I expected it to be, but and I guess that's mainly because we're launching empty, and we are launching empty only because we can refuel it in orbit thanks to routine mission manager. So I suppose we can thank this mod for making this project much easier than it would normally be. This time when uh, landing the booster I decided that uh, I won't be taking any chances and decided to land it at a very safe distance from KSC to avoid uh, potential explosions and uh, building damage. And uh, yeah, as you can see, we landed no problem, so um, this part of the mission was completed. On Duna, our research space station is still producing extra science from all the data that we've collected from Duna's surface, mainly, right now, mainly from the Endurance. And uh, yes, another two laboratories have just completed data processing and we've gained almost 1000 science points. So uh, yes, the entire tech tree is pretty much unlocked right now, there's only one node left. And soon, we will start converting that extra science into funds. 
On Duna's surface, Endurance is still exploring Duna Midland Sea. Most of the driving was done automatically by Bon Voyage and uh, I just uh, drive the last bits uh, manually. And I'm pretty sure that at some point I will just crash this rover because every time I, I take control of it, <laughs> there is a, a near critical accident that is happening. And yes, we've arrived at Duna Midland Sea and then our next destination would be Duna Midlands Canyon, where I would like to send this rover. And uh, I was actually thinking that maybe you would like to help me to decide on our next destination. And for that I will upload a Duna map that was taken by one of our satellites, with all the stops that we've made so far, and uh, potential destinations for the future. And, um, and uh, then we can decide where we would like to send our rover next. So, thank you very much for watching, I hope that you've enjoyed. If you enjoyed, please consider liking this video. If you're new to my channel, please consider subscribing. My name is Mark Frim and I will see you next time. Bye.